welcome to lecture 33. So, I will just briefly recapitulate what we did about monomorphism and then go on to polymorphism today. Right. So, we defined the language of this simply type lambda calculus where there was a where there is a there is a notion of some base types and the construction of uh, the construction of higher types from the base types. And these base types which for simplicity I took to be integer and boolean are really what might be called type constants. I mean is they are really I mean if when you say something when you give something the name integer it is in the in the domain of types it is a constant. Now, the significance of that will become evident slightly later, but it is important to remember that they are type constants. Okay. <coughs> so, you can construct <coughs> complex types using the simple language that we gave uh, for constructing higher types from these type constants. So, essentially what it means is that all your types will be of the form, um, let us say if int and bool are your base types, then you will have types of this form int arrow int, int arrow bool may be you could have you could have for example, higher types like int arrow int arrow bool arrow bool and so on. I mean what I mean is all your type expressions are going to be of this form. All your type expressions will have the names of the base types always occurring in it. I mean, there's there's nothing else. There's nothing else to it. Okay. So, and then we gave a type inferencing system for for this, which from which you can prove that uh, uh, you can prove that every combinator, therefore, that every or every lambda expression in the simply type lambda calculus actually has a unique type based on the type expression based on these inference rules. Yeah. So, given that a variable has a certain type which a variable could have a higher type also. Remember that we are treating functions and variable uh, functions and values all as equal objects. So, for example, this x could be of type int arrow int which denotes that it is a function from integers to integers. And uh, you could infer therefore, the types of all the lambda abstractions, uh, all the lambda expressions in the language which are typable. And if they are not typable, then of course, it does not belong to the simply type lambda calculus. And uh, uh, the beta reduction is of course, modified to take typing into account. So, that only if you have a lambda abstraction which is typable, which is typable as something arrow something and as let us say sigma arrow tau and you have an operand which is of type sigma assuming that these types can be inferred and therefore, they are well typed terms. Then you can perform a beta reduction and get a value of type tau. <laughs> right. So, one of the things was that uh, so we looked at some examples dealing with the identity functions. And uh, so, what what we notice at, at this point is that every every combinator or useful function because of because of the type inferencing system because every combinator has a unique type which is built up from the base types. Therefore, for what used to be typeless combinators which could be applied anywhere in the in the untyped lambda calculus for each one of them you have several copies depending on the type of application right so even a, a simple integer uh, a simple identity function then therefore has an incarnation for integers has an incarnation for booleans has an incarnation for all functions from integers to booleans so for every tau that you can think about there is a separate identity function i tau. Okay. And they all 
uh, and this is because of the unique typing feature of the sim simply type <coughs> lambda calculus, right. So, for each type tau the combinator C any uh, the, 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 the analog of the combinator C in the untyped lambda calculus when you move it into the simply type lambda calculus for each type tau you will get a combinator C tau which respects that typing. Okay. So, and of course, we ask this question whether we are actually being too harsh by using a simple typing scheme. And uh, one thing of course, is that these simple typing schemes were what were used in some of the older programming languages like Pascal and uh, Modula and so on and so forth. And of course, there are some questions, I mean we, we actually went through the computations of twice applied to itself and so on and we found that some of them could actually be given a meaning. So, not all self application really is meaningless. And uh, secondly, the, the point is that these, if you take any combinator C, is really too tedious to have so many different copies of it for each you have a combinator C tau for each possible tau the combinator could be some complex program right. So, uh, it is really too tedious to have something like this. What we would like when we think of an identity function what we actually are implying really is that it is a higher order function which given a function of any type tau returns you the same function actually, but returns you a result of the type tau. So, the, and the, the, so the identity function regardless of the type for which it is meant actually is, is one really higher order function which could be parameterized on the type. So, we can talk about i the identity combinator i being parameterized on a type tau and i tau would therefore, and the result should be i tau which is the appropriate combinator for values of type tau. By values I also include functions, right. So, so and in fact such uh, such a generalized what, what I might call a parameterized typing. So, what we should be able to do is we should be able to take this identity call a general identity function i and parameterize it on the subscript right and that is that is what polymorphism is about. Then we have an identity function uh, which actually takes a type itself as a parameter and then specializes to that type right. So, we, and uh, as we saw there are lots of uh, lots of functions which are re, which we use uh, in all our ML programming and so on which really are of that kind. The head and tail functions, the cons function, the map function, uh, they are all in that sense polymorphic. I mean in the sense that they the, the, the actual function is not very crucially dependent on the underlying base type from which your data type is constructed. I mean the, the function remains more or less unchanged except for the type for all possible kinds of arguments that you might get or at least for a class of possible arguments. For example, I mean you cannot apply cons on an integer uh, uh, cons for between two integers, but there is a class of arguments namely integers and int integer lists, booleans and boolean lists. Maybe integer integer to integer functions and lists of integer to integer functions and so on for there is a class of objects for which cons is going to have essentially the same representation and our intuitive meaning of cons is just that given some given some argument of type tau and given another argument of a type list of elements of type tau you should be able to perform a cons and the, the, the implementation or the meaning should not significantly vary with the with variations in the underlying type tau right. So, so, so the monomorphism actually has this real problem that you cannot adequately parameterize it. So, we generalize monomorphic types so that they give us this general flexibility 
and that means that in addition to these type constants which are the base types, we also allow for type variables. Okay. So, and that is that is intuitively even how we look at the let us say even a simple function like the identity function. Right. So, what, what we are saying by a general identity function is that for any type t and for any value or function x which is of type t, the identity combinator i t when applied to x is somehow beta equivalent actually it should beta reduce in many steps may be to x itself. Okay. Now, what we can do if is if you look at the lambda abstraction as we have looked at it, I told you the analog of the lambda abstraction with sets. The lambda abstraction also has its analog with uh, universally quantified objects. Okay. So, and this is essentially a universal quantification. So, if you look at the lambda, if you look at a lambda term of the, let's let's look at the identity combinator. What we are essentially saying by this bound variable x is that we are saying that for any x, return back the value of x. Okay. In the case of sets, what we were saying is. Uh, if, if you had a predicate here, let us say p dependent on x, we are saying for any x such that the predicate p of x is true. So, the set notation, the lambda abstraction and universal quantification are all very, very similar and we will use this fact. So, if you were to actually read whatever we have been saying now, a good way to read it is as if it is a universally quantified object. For each type t and for any value or function x of type t, i t of x should be beta equal to x. So, what we did is that we stopped here in our lambda calculus, in our simply typed lambda calculus, we stopped with this abstraction, we just translated this abstraction into the combinator i t. Right? But if we go beyond this abstraction also into this abstraction, okay, then what you get is a general combinator i. Okay? So, for you can read this as for any t and for any x of type t return x. Okay? And I am just and since the I mean the universal quantification and predicate uh, logic is really like lambda abstraction, I am just using the universal quantifier here. So, this identity the generalized identity combinator that we are really looking for is really has a type which is given by a universally quantified type variable. The moment you have got, so now the, here, here you have got a case where there is a variable which is bound by this universal quantifier. Right? So, this is like a, again I mean this is like a local declaration, uh, this, 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 is, this is like a predicate if you like. So, but this local declaration clearly specifies that for any type so, the identity combinator is has a type such that for any type t, it has a functionality, a functionality t arrow t, where I do not really care what value you give this t. Okay? If you are generalizing from monomorphic types, then what you can say is that this variable t may be may take any value from the monomorphic types defined by this by the language of uh, types right so for example so this t could be a value like int it could be bool it could be int arrow bool it could be int arrow int arrow bool and and so on and so forth any of the types that we have so far defined in our 
uh, simple type structure could be a value for t and the identity approximately and that and that identity combinator will uh, will uh, will appropriately take those values t okay so now what we are looking at is i mean we we started out with variables and constants way back in the in the in the paleolithic period where constants and variables really took values from an underlying domain of values we took then we got functions unnamed functions which are also variables we generalize fun, we generalize the notion of variables to functions untyped functions where the functions could take values from well function spaces an underlying domain which is function spaces now we are going further and we are taking the domains themselves types are really those domains and those domains are fixed so far and now we are generalizing them we are saying you take a variable over which takes values which are the naming of particular domains right so the domain int arrow int could be a particular value of this variable t okay and this universal this is like a universal quantification okay so if this lambda abstraction is like a universal quantification then lambda abs, then lambda application or a beta redex is like universal instantiation so i mean you, you you studied this quantifier elimination and introduction rules so lambda abstraction the quantifier introduction and beta reduction is quantifier elimination yeah or universal instantiation so you can instantiate the t here by any particular type constant that you like or any type expression which is built up only from type constants so t could so you can talk of type variables which actually take values and those values are type expressions built up from type constants and that is what polymorphism is about right so this is what is known as a parametric polymorphism and this is the param this is the polymorphism that is present in ml yeah so <coughs> so let's let's look at the function for example twice so the reason twice is meaningful then is really that it is a function of this form if you look at the definition of twice i can say that for any type t for any function f of type t arrow t and for any value or function x of type t twice f twice applied to f applied to x should be beta equal to f applied to f applied to x right so this is this is this is the basic fact we know about twice and now go back upwards and do the abstraction so what do you get you get f applied to f applied to x you perform the abstraction on x to be of type t then you perform the abstraction on f to be of type t arrow t and so far it's really like the simply type lambda calculus and then actually we have an yet another abstraction a universal quantification over the type t and so this essentially says for every type t and for every function f which has a type t arrow t and for any argument x which has a type t return the result f applied to f applied to x and so what is the type of twice i will 
I mean the problem the point now is that now we have two kinds of beta reductions. I mean if, univer if universal instantiation if, if lambda expressions are really like universally quantified predicates then beta reduction is like universal instantiation okay. Then uh, and universal instantiation is like beta reduction which means when you universally quantify on types and instantiate those types you get a form of beta reduction also for types in addition to the beta reduction that you already have for the lambda expressions. So, it is so as you can see things can get a little hairy at this point I mean okay. So, we have variables we have type variables we have constants if you are applying the lambda calculus onto some domain and you will also have type uh, type constants and then you can have instantiations of those variables, instantiations of those values, uh, instantiations of value variables, instantiations of type variables by type expressions, by uh, expressions of the application and you will be inferring types, you will be inferring. So, types and values also look essentially the same, you are going to have a beta reduction for type expressions for quantified type expressions which which is like another lambda expression only this lambda is abstraction is on types and it is not on values. And of course, values are the same as functions whatever may be the order right, but types are different, but still the types also follow essentially the same discipline of quantification, beta of application, beta reduction universal generalization, universal instantiation, quantifier elimination, quantifier introduction and everything and this is the, this is the and so uh, okay and so, so what is the type of twice? So, I will just assume that you already know the inference rules, you can get the inference rules by analogy. So, we can actually by structural induction on the inference rules which are predictable now, you can actually infer the type of twice. <coughs> in this fashion. So, given that f is of type t arrow t and x is of type t, f, f applied to x will be of type t, f applied to f applied to x will be of type t too because of this f is of type t arrow t and f x is of type t therefore, f applied to f x will be of type t. Then when you perform the abstraction over x, I am doing this bottom up of course, but uh, but that is always easier to understand for the human being. That is not necessarily how the machine will do it, how your compiler will do it. Note that all this has to be done by the compiler. So, it will do it by a structural induction, you can assume for practical purposes it will be doing it by a recursive descent parsing method as part of the parsing process. Type determination is part of the parsing, before the code generation you do the type determination in order to decide whether code has to be generated at all. And so, you will do it in a recursive descent parse, parsing fashion and come up. So, then this abstraction gives you this type, then the abstraction over f gives you this type and the abstraction over t gives you this type. Right? So, essentially what we are saying is that functions like twice which are actually meaningful, they are meaningful even under self application because when twice is applied to twice, the operator twice has a type since twice is polymorphic, its type is universally quantified we can always choose a type for the operand twice and generalize it so that the operator twice has a higher type than the operand twice and that is in fact what normally happens in mathematics. When you apply one function to another, when you apply a function to another. The, op the operator always has a higher type than the operand. 
Now, since twice is polymorphic, this twice when you apply twice to itself, this is the operator twice and this is the operand twice. The operator twice is of a much higher type than the operand twice. So, you assign if you assign if you assign to twice this the operand twice a, a type tau and that type tau would be an expression of this form universally quantified a universally quantified type expression of this form. Then, so if this has a type tau where tau is let us say some for all sigma such that I, I have I have missed out a t here there should be t, a t here t arrow t goes to t arrow t right for all so for all sigma uh, if if this twice has the type for all sigma sigma arrow sigma arrow sigma arrow sigma then this twice has a type the, so the result of applying this twice to this twice should give you an element of type tau right so then this twice has a type which is really given by I don't know, tau arrow tau arrow tau arrow tau on application treated in general it has a type when you look at this twice in uh, I mean and that tau arrow tau arrow tau arrow tau has to come out as a particular case of this sigma by, by a suitable no substitution process. I leave that as an exercise to you, but essentially polymorphism means that <coughs> an expression is polymorphic if it can actually have different types depending on the context in which it is applied right. So, the two uh, so the application of twice to twice is meaningful provided the operator twice has a higher type which is compatible with the operand twice which is compatible with the twice of the operand. A particular case of this is something that you can you can see in any standard book on polymorphism. Uh, programming languages. Okay, so, what we will do is let us formalize these notions. Um, so, we have the language of what I might call polytypes. Okay. So, now the language of polytypes as opposed to the language of monotypes which is what we did in the simply type lambda calculus is firstly you assume an infinite collection of type variables and a collection of type constants and these type constants are usually are the usually consist of the base types uh, which you are going to start off with. So, let us say integer and boolean and then firstly you we build we build up the monotypes in the same fashion that we did for the simply type lambda calculus. So, if B is a base type then B is also a monotype and if tau 1 and tau 2 are monotypes then tau 1 arrow tau 2 is a monotype. In addition you allow type variables also to be regarded as monotypes. So, type variables actually are going to denote particular instances of monotypes. Right? Then we build our polytypes like this. Any monotype is also a polytype, and any more any polytype quantified over a free type variable. The notion of free and bound variables is as before. Over type expressions, uh, if if pi is some type, 
then any variable that occurs in it, any type variable that occurs in pi is a free type variable and you can quantify over type variables and then that variable becomes bound. Okay? So, uh, so this is how we construct polytypes. Yeah, so, this is the kind of I mean, I mean there is I mean if you just extend this argument further we could also construct super polytypes by a similar grammar. I mean, given that pi is a polytype you could define a collection of an infinite collection of super type variables, a collection of polytypes over polytypes and then super polytypes being defined in a similar fashion. Yeah, and so I mean this the type of hierarchy actually can go <coughs> ad infinitum upwards. The lowest part of the type hierarchy are the monotypes. Yeah, right. And below the monotypes, of course, are values and functions. Right. So, but let's let's limit ourselves to just this, the type hierarchy at, at two levels. So there are just type variables, and type variables can vary can take values only from monotypes and monotypes or whatever was were defined in the simply type lambda calculus right so and then you can construct a polytype by quantifying over the monotypes or quantifying over the type variables right so now so the polymorphic lambda calculus is defined in this fashion. So, we have the usual syntax of the simply type lambda calculus. Remember that this is a monotype. Remember that the simply type lambda calculus was very nice in the sense that it gave you everything that was that could be statically type determinable. It, it could type check statically, but the only problem was that the simply type lambda calculus could not account <coughs> for generalized combinators like i or twice which are polymorphic i is of course very very general twice is not so general i mean twice can <coughs> will type check only for certain classes of um, arguments argument types i mean for example you can't give twice a value from the base type it won't type check for example you can't apply twice on an integer twice can be applied only to another function which means it should have a type of the form some t1 arrow t2 i mean it could only apply to another object which has a type t1 arrow t2 it cannot apply to a to a base uh, to a just a base type it has to apply to a function <coughs> right so but that is essentially like the way we write uh, uh, sets right let's take this x such that x is even and then it satisfies some other property i mean you can you can take subtypes of the i mean you can you can take subsets of the naturals and uh, uh, write generalized set definitions right which is which is still quite general right so so the so functions like twice are polymorphic in the sense that they do not range over the entire type hierarchy whereas the the, the combinator i actually ranges over the entire type hierarchy you can give it a value a function a type variable anything and the identity combinator will work it will just give you back whatever you asked whatever you gave it but the twice requires an argument which has a type of a certain form that it should be explicitly a function form it cannot be a value form not only that it should explicitly be a function form it should it cannot be a function form of type t1 arrow t2 where t1 and t2 are completely different it has to have a type t1 arrow t1 so all for all instantiations of t1 such that the types such that you have functions from t1 arrow t1 
the twice can be applied that is the type of twice right so th that's that's what is obvious from its from the definition of that function abstraction in twice right so so now what we have is in addition to the monotypes we have the type abstraction on on lambda abstractions uh, on on lambda terms right so this is the standard is the type abstraction which i pointed out and this is actually an application of a monotype of a of a lambda of presumably a lambda term which takes a type as a parameter. So, if this lambda term were the combinator i, were the polymorphic combinator i, you could give it any monotype as an argument and it will specialize to that particular i tau. Okay. In the case of i, of course, this tau could be anything, anything in the monotypes. In the case of twice, this tau would have to be of the form sigma arrow sigma, where sigma arrow sigma is constructed constructible from the base types through the monotype context free grammar right so so this is actually a type application this is actually an application of a lambda term to a monotype so as to specialize that combinator for that particular type yeah and then uh, for well, for completeness, since this was all this was there in Ravi Sethi's book, uh, I decided to add this construct. Also, uh, so here is a let expression where so, but these are all mono. Where, wherever I have written tau, it's a monotype. Wherever I that means it's a, it's a it's a restricted part of the type grammar that we have got. I mean, it's they're all simple. Tau is a monotype means that it comes from the language of simply type of the simply type lambda calculus with uh, of the, the language of type types in the simply type lambda calculus, but with, with the added construction that you could have variables instead of actual uh, expressions built up of type constants. Okay. But now we can take a polytype Okay, so, you, if x is a supposed to be a polytype, then this is this whole let construct is a lambda application in which all free occurrences of x in this will be replaced by this and it should type check. Okay. So, we will look at it, we will we'll look at this construct a little more carefully uh, later, but essentially the most important additions are really that are really this the new type application and the type abstraction. This type application means that there is a beta reduction for types okay. and this is the construction of more complex functions which are polymorphic from the polytypes themselves. Yeah. So, this is really uh, this is actually a form of lambda abstract, uh, lambda application as you can as you will be able to see right. Uh, uh, when we when I give the rules it should become clear, but for the moment let go of this or rather let us keep this because I am going to give an example which illustrates this right. So, it is a very nice example again drawn from Ravi Sethi's book. So, let us take twice. So, I have this expression which is really let twice which is defined in this fashion, okay. twice is of type this, it is polymorphic as you can see because it has a universal quantifier over type variables. So, it is not a monotype. So, consider the polymorphic function twice whose definition is given by this okay in the expression twice int 
successor. The successor is the standard successor function written in the lambda calculus. We'll, we are assuming applying it on integers, let us say. So, for any x, the successor of x is as defined by piano arithmetic, right. So, now what we are saying here is apply first twice on to integers. That means particularize twice to integer functions. That means functions from integers to integers. So, what you get when you apply twice to integers is a new function which is particularized to all functions of the type of the monotype integer to integer. Apply that function onto successor, okay. The result of which has to be applying successor twice onto whatever is the argument. And if you apply, and the result of, so the result of this application is to particularize twice to the type int arrow int and having particularized twice to int arrow int, you apply it now to successor which is which is a function from int arrow int. So, it is perfectly understandable, right. So, it is type compatible, okay. Since successor is a is a function, is a, since successor is lambda x x prime where x prime is going to be int and therefore, this lambda abstraction gives successor the type int arrow int. So, this twice applied to int gives you a function twice subscript int arrow int which applied to this function successor which is of type int arrow int. So, therefore, it is applicable. I am sorry, twice applied to int gives me a function int arrow int arrow int arrow int, which applied to a function successor which is of type int arrow int gives me a result which is a function of type int arrow int, which given the argument 0 gives me a value in int. So, essentially it will give the value 2, which seems a hell of a big mess to get into just in order to get the value 2, but uh, in principle it is it is a powerful operation. So, I have just I have just showed how the beta reduction uh, works for particularizing. So, the beta reduction for types for polymorphic types is to really particularize that function for a particular for a certain type right or instantiate the universal quantifier in the type to a particular kind. So, this twice applied to int is actually what I have written in, in, in if you if I follow the notation that I used before, it is actually twice particularized to int. So, it is really I would have given the subscript int arrow int arrow int arrow int right. So, it, this this twice works only for works only on functions of the form int arrow int. <coughs> of course, there is a possibility that I could have applied twice on a type variable too and I could have put that variable may have may be quantified somewhere later okay if, if, if I can have nested quantifiers right for all s for all t and so on and so forth then that variable might get its value uh, might get its type value because of the instantiation of a quantifier that exists somewhere in the outer scope right and then so then for if so and if i look at this restricted subterm then it would be twice with the subscript t arrow t arrow t arrow t where t should get its value instantiated somehow later right so now we can actually uh, and since beta reduction is uh, so the so, so so now you understand why beta reduction is really important 
checking whether membership in a set is really a form of beta reduction. Applying functions is really a form of beta reduction. Universal instantiation is really a form of beta reduction. And constructing sets by abstraction is really a form of lambda abstraction. Uh, constructing quantified uh, predicates is really a form of lambda abstraction. Quant constructing types is really a form of lambda abstraction. So applying types and instantiating them is also a form of beta reduction. So, so beta reduction in computation is really the most fundamental concept which, which has probably evolved over the last 40 years. Almost anything that is constructive, by constructive anything that is computationally relevant has beta reduction appearing in some form or the other. Parameter passing in procedures is a form of beta reduction. Whether the parameters are passed by value or by reference or by name, they are all forms of beta reduction. And now types are also forms of beta reduction. So the generics that you have in C++ and ADA are really some very restricted form of beta reduction applied only to some base types. And the, so far in, in terms of uh, implemented programming languages, the highest form of the most sophisticated type system that has so far come up is the ML polymorphism, which is completely statically determinable, where types are completely polymorphic types are statically determinable, which means they are determinable at translation time without going into executions. Yeah? So that is one of the reasons for studying ML because it is uh, it's a functional, it is not just that it is a functional language, but also that it has a very sophisticated type system. The most sophisticated type system in existence uh, in an implemented programming language is, is in ML. So the type inferencing rules, now actually by now you would, have, you would have got a flavor of the type inferencing rules that you should have and uh, these are essentially it. So given a variable, so again given a type context gamma or a type environment gamma, the type of a variable x is whatever, uh, this x is free, right? So if, so whatever, if, if the context does not contain x, then it does not type check as simple as that and you throw out that program. But so whatever the context in give for x is the type of x and this is the usual application of functions. If L is of type sigma arrow tau, which are by the way sigma and tau are monotypes, this is, this is the monomorphic application and M is of type sigma which is again a monotype, then L applied to M is of type tau. If with the assumption that x is of type sigma added to the context, you can infer that L is of type tau, then the lambda abstraction x sigma L has the type sigma arrow tau, where again all these sigmas and taus are monotypes, right. Okay. So that is as, so these, the, the type inferencing rules here are really like the type inferencing rules of the simply type lambda calculus and there is no difference. But what we require now are type inferencing for the polymorphic lambda calculus, right. So here, here goes. So if it is determinable that L has, that L has the polymorphic type for all t pi, where pi could itself be another polymorphic type because you could have quantifiers, you could have a sequence of quantifiers, right, uh, in nested quantifiers. So pi could be a polymorphic type. Then given tau a monotype, you cannot apply L to another polymorphic type, but you can apply it to a monotype. That is applying L to a monotype means particularizing L to a certain type. 
applying L to a polymorphic type does not exist in our language so far. Okay. But I mean as I said there is no reason to build up the type hierarchy, I mean you have quantifiers over polymorphic type variables too. I mean then you would have a particular reason, there is actually a reason for doing that but that is because it is not many of those things are, when you go from uh, to types higher than this it turns out that lots of problems about uh, of undecidability crop up. So this is about the limit that we are currently, we have currently reached. So given that tau is a monotype, you are particularizing the polymorphic lambda expression L so that an incarnation of it for the type tau is created by this application and if an inc and so that means what this universal quantifier for all t has to be instantiated has to be eliminated by instantiating t with the value tau and that is what this substitution does. So it takes pi and for all free occurrences of t in pi it replaces those free occurrences by the monotype tau. Okay, so this is a case, of, this is clearly a case of universal instantiation, it is also a form of beta reduction for the types. Yeah? So this is a type application or instantiation where pi is a polytype and tau is a monotype. Right. And then of course, uh, and this, so this is like universal instantiation, so there should be a corresponding universal generalization or quantifier introduction rule and that is what this does. Given that in the context gamma, you can show that L is of type a polytype pi, then this abstraction over the types, over the free variables t, over the free type variables t in pi gives you a polymorphic lambda expression which has a type for all t pi. So this is a type abstraction and very, it is very similar to the lambda abstraction. Yeah. The only thing of course is that whenever we are talking about free variables, whether it is type variables or value variables and whenever, whenever, whenever we are talking about binding them, we should ensure that there is no capture of free variables because of, your, because of the binding you are creating. Because of the introduction of this quantifier, you are creating a, you are binding this variable t and as a result, no t in pi which actually, so there should have, there should not be any t in the context gamma, okay, already defined because that t, if that t occurred in pi, then that t would get captured by this quantifier, okay. So the usual confusion of free variables, bound variables, alpha conversion with quantifiers and so on, I mean, I mean of course alpha conversion also exists anywhere where there is, anywhere where there is binding or declaration there is alpha conversion, right. And so you have to do alpha conversions over bound variables to ensure that there are no free variable captures, right. So T should not be free in gamma, that means T should not already have been declared in gamma. And then the last rule is just really a form of uh, type lambda application for the polymorphic case. If L is of type pi 1 which is a polymorphic type and with the assumption that X is of type pi 1, if you can infer that M is of type pi 2, then this let expression, this whole let expression really has the type of M because M is really the expression and the meaning of any let expression is the body of the expression which is which in this case is M, right. So it has a type pi 2. So let expressions uh, really are like applications because what you can, it is the semantics of a let expression is equivalent to substituting all free occurrences of X in M by L, yeah. So it is really a form of 
So, now you can look at you can go back and try to determine what the type of this is, right and uh, by now I mean so you have really reached the highest levels that types can reach in a decidable fashion. fashion.